morning. Good to see you here this morning. We have quite a few here that are visiting with us. Hope that you feel especially welcome this morning. Uh, we're so happy to see your face and uh, have you sing along and, and worship God with us. We're going to be in Matthew 22 this morning and studying from the book of Matthew. Uh, so if you want to get out your Bibles and go ahead and turn there, you're welcome to do that. That's primarily where we'll be this morning. Have you been on the playground with the kids and had the experience of choosing teams? I think just about all of us have gone through that, at least on some level. Uh, and it's not really a fun process. I mean, whether you're the best or the worst... Uh, nobody really likes this whole thing because who knows who's going to get chosen first and uh, maybe sometimes it's always the same person and you just know it's not going to be you and maybe sometimes you experience not being chosen at all uh, and I've, I've experienced that I've experienced being chosen and then the heartbreak of someone not being chosen and watching them sadly walk off the basketball court unable to play with everybody else that's just not a good picture uh, we don't really like that hopefully uh, we're, we don't enjoy that but that is the way we do things what about when God chooses and this idea of God choosing throughout uh, the New Testament specifically uh, what does that mean, and what does that refer to? How does God choose, uh, and how does he select? It's going to be something that we uh, need to be thinking about and meditating on as we study our text this morning, and hopefully by the end of it, we'll have a little bit better understanding of this concept, even though we probably have a pretty good understanding of it from our studies in the book of Matthew. Uh, it's become pretty apparent to us that God chooses those who are humble, those who are meek, those who are mourning over their sins, and, and those who love God and want to serve him. But uh, as we study together in Matthew 22, hopefully we'll see that as well in a different way uh, in our study of this parable. Uh, let's start by reading this parable. Matthew 22, the first 14 verses, says... And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned down their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here we have another parable of Jesus uh, in the book of Matthew. We've seen lots of parables coming from Jesus. And this parable is similar to others that we've studied where he compares uh, a story to the kingdom of heaven to help us understand better what the kingdom of heaven is like. And in this case, he compares it to a wedding feast that the king holds for his son. Can you imagine 
being invited to the wedding feast of the king. Uh, we have a president. Imagine being invited to the wedding feast of the president's son uh, and what that would be like and how exciting that would be. If you were a Jew in this time, listening to Jesus, there's been a lot of parables that he's been giving, a lot of statements he's been making about the kingdom. But as you hear these words, that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding feast for his sons, you might start to think about all the wonderful blessings of the kingdom of God that you know are coming to those who are his people. This is something they were looking forward to for years and years, knowing God was going to one day give the people a kingdom that's full of joy and gladness and rejoicing and feasting and celebration over the blessings God has given them. And so to hear these words, the kingdom of heaven is like a marriage feast that a king throws for his sons, would have sounded really exciting and encouraging. But if you know what he just said leading up to this, <laughs> then you know that there's some, there's some very difficult things going on. Uh, in this parable, as we read through it and as we study through it, we see those difficult things. If you just look at the last parable, uh, he talked about a vineyard who, who was being taken care of by tenants, and it sounds a lot like Israel uh, throughout the Old Testament, but the tenants rebel against the master of the vineyard, and so the master is going to come in, and it says in verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. The, the message of the last parable was, you're not going to have a part in this kingdom because you don't give God the glory. And now we have a parable of a wedding feast, and this sounds great. Uh, who's going to get to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom that God is going to establish on the earth? Well, the king sends out uh, his servants to call those who are invited to the wedding feast, but we see they won't come. These people were previously invited, but now it says they just they don't want to come. They don't want to be a part of the wedding feast that the king has prepared for them. It's kind of odd, isn't it, that the, the people who knew that the feast was coming, who, who agreed to come to the feast probably in the past, have now decided they don't want any part in the feast that the king is now throwing. And, and the king even sends another group of servants to them, telling them, everything is ready. Come on. We've got the, the fat the fat and calf's been killed. The ox has been killed. There's a lot of meat. There's a lot of celebrating that's going to be had. This is the king's wedding feast. Can you imagine what that would look like? But they won't come. And this time, there's reasons given. It says in verse 5, they paid no attention and went off. Paid no attention. It says that they, they went off, one to his farm and another to his business. They were too busy for the wedding feast. They were too busy for the, the celebration that the king had set up for his son, they didn't have time for all of that. They were too busy handling their own stuff and living their own life. They've got a farm to tend to. They've got a business to tend to. They can't just take off whenever they want and go and celebrate with the king the way he wants them to. They've got some important stuff to do. And some were so offended, it says that they killed the servants of the king. Who in their right mind... <laughs> would kill the servants of the king. I mean, come on, give me a break. That is insane. Who would do that? But they did it. They rejected the opportunity that the king had placed before them. And not only did they reject it, but they spit in the king's face, so to speak, killing his servants. If you were to take this uh, as the last parable... And Jesus didn't do this, but in the last parable he said, what will the master do when he comes to the vineyard? If you were to say, what will the king do now? We all know what the king will do to those who have killed his servants. And this is exactly what it says he would do. Uh, it says, verse 7, the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. 
you were a Jew at that time listening to this parable, what would you be thinking as he speaks these words of destruction toward those who have rejected the celebration for the king's son? Well, the king didn't just destroy. The text tells us that the king sends his servants out again. And this time they go out into the city and it says they will gather those who are good and those who are bad because the king will have his marriage feast. One way or another, he's going to have his marriage feast. And he's going to invite everybody who wasn't invited before. He's going to bring them in and allow them to enjoy the feast that he has prepared. And then the story takes this really odd twist beginning with verse 11, with a guest coming in, being given this wonderful opportunity to, to enjoy the feast of the, the king and his son in that wedding. But he fails to prepare for it. Maybe he thinks, well, the king's inviting in all these bad people. I guess the king doesn't care what we look like or what we do or how we act. He's obviously lost all form of etiquette. And so he just comes in carelessly and wears what he wants to wear. And we find out that the king has not completely loosened his proper etiquette. He will judge those who have not prepared for the wedding, as though this is a great opportunity. And we see in this that the wicked was supposed to change. Yeah, you're bad, but you're allowed to come in. But there's an expectation that you would honor the king and that you would do what is right and formal and good as you get the opportunity to enjoy a feast with the king. That's the way they should have seen this, but they don't. And so the king says, cast him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What an interesting parable to have at this stage in Jesus' teaching as he is in Jerusalem, about to go to the cross, telling the Jews of all the things that they have done and all the things that God is planning for them. What does this show to us? Well, that last statement, for many are called, but few are chosen, is his explanation of the parable. There's no greater detail given about this parable, but these words, many are called, but few are chosen. What does this mean? What is, the, what is the purpose behind this parable? What do we get out of this parable as we study it? Notice that there's a large group of people that were initially invited. They were called to come in to the wedding, the feast, and enjoy. And they rejected the opportunity. And then more were called. Those who were good and those who were bad were called. And they had the opportunity to come into the wedding feast and enjoy the blessings of the king and the king's son's celebration. But notice, the only people who were allowed to stay for the feast are those who prepared themselves for the feast. And they were chosen to enjoy all the blessings of it. It seems as though Jesus is making a very clear statement that lines up with everything he's been saying in the previous parables that those who give God glory are chosen and precious in God's sight, and those who refuse to give God the glory will be rejected. That's what he's been saying. He's been going through this over and over again as he's entered into Jerusalem, pointing out that these Jews are self-seeking in their glory. They're, They're trying to do their own thing apart from what God has done for them, acting as though they can have their own righteousness and do their own uh, and create their own system where everybody gives them the fruits, everybody gives them the glory, and they don't give God the glory, and they think God's going to give them the glory as well. That's not what God is looking for. Jesus, going all the way back to the curse of the fig tree, has pointed out, you don't honor and reverence and glorify 
the one who's given you the opportunity to be his chosen people, you were called, but you will not be the chosen people of God. There's an expectation that the one who is called would not only respond to the call and the invitation, but that he would then glorify God as he accepts the invitation. There's a need for there to be tremendous gratitude and thankfulness in the heart of a person that would provoke them to glorify the king by dressing appropriately for the wedding feast. Now, it doesn't sound like a big deal to us, right? But if, if we were to show up and invite it to President Trump's son's wedding or President Biden's grandchild's wedding, and we were to show up in our pajamas or in our Halloween costume, we would probably be asked to leave. It's just, it's disrespectful. And maybe it would be a showing of defiance against the system and against the, the rulers of the land. And he's not going to stand for that. It's just the graciousness has been extended and it's been spat upon. And there is no acceptance of the one who would do such a thing. This is an important message for us as well. We look at this and we look at the Jews and we see what they did and we say, that's what happened. They were given the call hundreds of years before Jesus came. And Jesus is the son and he's got this wonderful marriage feast that's talked about throughout scripture that that is being prepared for God's people to enjoy the blessings of it. And these Jewish people refuse to accept him, refuse to answer the call. And as a result, they will be rejected. But what about us? What do we learn from this story? Do we see that the kingdom of heaven is intended to be seen by us as a kingdom of joy and as a wedding feast? where we get to enjoy the presence of the king and enjoy the the blessings of the king as he showers them upon us. And we're not really deserving of this. Uh, We are not Jews even who have endured so much and been God's chosen people for so long. We are Gentiles and we don't deserve it, but we have this tremendous opportunity given to us. And like those in the streets who were told, hey, Nobody can, nobody's coming to the wedding feast. You can come. We should be responding with the same kind of zeal and love and excitement over the opportunity that we have been given. But we learn from this that it's only for those who are chosen. And going back to what I said at the beginning, what does it mean that God chooses? And, and how does God choose? Who is the chosen Isn't it interesting how this parable tells us that so concretely? We might think, well, God's only going to choose the best. He's only going to choose the most righteous. Uh, That's the only people that he goes after. And if we're not the most righteous, then we don't have a chance. But it says the good and the bad are called to come in. And once they're called to come in, and they, they accept the invitation and they come in, it's an expectation that they would prepare to meet the king. And that's the statement for us to take away from this lesson. We have to accept the invitation, whether we're good or bad, and we have to prepare to meet our king. He's worthy of our honor and our glory all that we can give him because we are completely undeserving for this to be given to us. So as we look at a text like this, I want us to notice that there is an invitation that's available to everyone in this building. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter how many bad things you've done in the past, there's an invitation that is available to you to come to the king's wedding feast. (laughs) 
Isn't that amazing? A blessing that has been showered upon us. And then the question becomes, do we care about this opportunity? Do we care? The invitation's given. Do we just reject it and say, no, I'm, I'm good. I've got, I've, got, I've got a lot of other important things to do right now. Do we just say, not right now, I'm too busy, I've got all this work, I've got all this other stuff going on in my life. I don't have time to carve out to serve the Lord and to do what he wants me to do. How many of us are too busy to serve the Lord faithfully? He's giving you a tremendous opportunity. The invitation is here. Will we be foolish like the Jews and say, not right now. I don't like it in that way. I don't want to spend my time serving the Lord. I don't want to spend my time understanding him and following after his ways. I don't want to prepare to meet God and to to go through all that work. If we miss this, we miss everything. It just sounds like a a feast, you know, just like a one-day event. But actually, in those days, it had been seven days. (laughs) But really, it just sounds like this temporary thing. But what Jesus is alluding to is the eternal rejoicing and feasting in the presence of God that is available to all those who serve him. This is not a mere feast that you're being invited to. This is eternal life with God. Put in a way that we might be able to grasp it because we're very physical and we focus on the the little things. Hey, I love food like anybody, right? And so this really makes you salivate and like, hey, you're going to get done early, right, Casey, because we're ready to eat. Uh, Yeah, this this is really trying to come at our senses and pull us to what God is preparing for us. And it's worth it. But we have to prepare to meet God. The amazing thing about all this is there's a promise that God will clothe us with his righteousness. That's what I had Corey read at the beginning of this. There's a promise that God says, I will clothe you with my righteousness. I will plant you and you will spring up and you will produce fruits and that God is going to clothe us. If we're, we're poor and lowly and weak and unable to provide for ourselves, to, to clothe ourselves with righteousness, to clothe ourselves in a way that would be honorable toward the king, the king says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to provide you with the clothing you need. And that is what Jesus gives us. The blood of Jesus covers our sins and helps us be prepared to meet our king. And that blood of Jesus washes us clean of all sins. As we come to God in humble submission, that washing is always available to us. And there's also an expectation, of course, that it would transform our hearts and our minds so that we walk in love toward God and in love toward one another. That we glorify him with all that we have, as as little as that is to offer up, that we would do that for God out of great love for the tremendous grace that he has shown to us. This is God's call for you to receive all of the spiritual blessings that are offered in Christ. And if you're scared and you don't think that you're good enough, then that's right where God wants you to be. And it's time to just come forward And let him have his way with you. Let him be glorified in your transformation as he works through you to glorify himself. None of us are able to accomplish much of anything without him. He is the reason behind everything that I am able to do. He's the reason behind everything that everybody here who you might admire and look up to and respect. He's the reason why they're able to do what they're able to do. Their righteousness is not because of themselves. It's because of him and what he has done for them. And if you would like for him to work in your life and help you to grow, to become to the praise of his glory, and we can help you in some way, that opportunity is available for you If you will accept the call, don't reject it. If we can help you in some way, please come as we stand.
and as we sing. <laughs>